Hello, BookTube. It's Friday, and that means Friday Reads, and I've got a bunch of things I want to show you here. We'll start with, uh, these are not all for Friday, of course, these are for, for the weekend. I intend to get a lot of reading done this weekend, uh, and maybe into Monday a little. Uh, we'll start off with four rereads, and then we'll move on to three things that I haven't read yet that I'll be reading for the first time uh, this weekend. Um, the first reread is a little sad. <laughs> it's a little bittersweet. It's a beautiful edition, just reissued. Uh, it's Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain uh, in a new uh, deck ledge uh, in the French flaps and also a neat thing they they made holograph copies of some of his uh, running commentary on his own book uh, for a little bit I think it, it, kind, it looks like it kind of fades out towards the middle but uh, that'll make that makes this paperback edition when does this when does this come out uh, all right, this is out already. This this is probably the paperback that's in your bookstores now, and it makes it one to have. It makes it one. I mean, it's got a new introduction. It's got those notes, and it's also got the book itself, which is enduringly good, enduringly wise, and funny. Mainly funny. It's uh, I I went into it with a little bit of trepidation when it first came out, uh, for a couple of reasons, <laughs> some of which are personal, but also uh, because I didn't think. It would appeal to me. I didn't think it would speak to me at all. I don't know anything about the world of, of haute cuisine or anything like that, but it turns out that it's really just a, uh, a novel. <laughs> and not only just a novel, but a picaresque novel by a genius. It's a genius of writing that kind of thing. There's hardly a, uh, <clears throat> there's hardly a moment that isn't rendered with a perfect ear for pacing and dialogue in this thing. So I, I will read it again. I wish its author was still alive. I wish that he died peacefully and happy in his bed. Uh, but uh, that's that's a reread uh, for this time around. Then another another reread is something we saw a little bit earlier today. Uh, it's this. It's uh, Hazards of Time Travel by Joyce Carol Oates, uh, in which a, a rebellious, free-thinking woman in the near future is sent back in time uh, as, as an exile, as punishment for her free-thinking in the present day. Uh, so that Joyce Carol Oates can examine all kinds of issues uh, of the cloistered world of academia, in the cloistered world of a small town, uh, the idea of finding a, a like-minded soul and maybe love, the idea of being a, an, an exile from totalitarianism of you know of thought and speech and whatnot. Uh, and I got a lot of that. Some of it seemed to me to be more effective than others, parts of it. And the one thing, like I mentioned when I first held this book up today, well, the one thing that I mentioned that annoyed me is that uh, nowhere in the book is the idea that the government has discovered time travel <laughs> given anything like it's It's a plot convenience, mostly. And it shouldn't be. It wouldn't be. Uh, that's that's just not how it would work. If, if you're going to make something like that, if you're going to introduce something like that, Merely as a convenience, mainly as a convenience for you to talk about other things, that's in that has always struck me with mainstream authors who dabble in science fiction that that's the the laziness that they bring to their carpet bagging is that they want the gimmick but they don't want the thought that goes along with it. Uh, and I thought that it, that would annoy me throughout this book, but my first reading of it uh, the, pretty much wiped it away. I was it, it was it's so well done that I was willing to to, to forgive her that. As I sometimes am. <laughs> I don't. I don't always insist. It's not always poorly done. Uh, and, and then that was that. But then uh, uh, Britta Bowler, a fellow booktuber, legendary fellow booktuber, uh, strongly suggested that this book would benefit from a reread. So I will reread it. Uh, uh, and then the uh, next two, one of which I think we saw on this channel, they're just gorgeous uh, trade paperbacks. Just matte finish, really, really well bound, really strong. Uh, but I see. Two, two paperbacks like this really makes me wish that this is how the books appeared originally. And, and maybe for, for you know, three or four dollars less money because the, com the company, the publisher, in this case Simon & Schuster, never had to pay for the hardcover, for the lavish expenses of a hardcover run that doesn't sell out or come close to it. Since they never had to invest that money, they had it to spare. Maybe you knock the price down on the paperbacks. They would sell. <laughs> they sell a lot more than I think they do. Uh, but the first one is one we've seen before. It's Thomas Childers' History of the Third Reich uh, in, in one of these one of these uh, Simon & Schuster paperbacks with a, the matte finish covers and just a really nice, floppy, solid binding. And this is a terrific book. It's a uh, very fast-paced, could be the fastest-paced Third Reich history that I've 
uh, that I've ever read. Uh, and uh, it doesn't doesn't pull any punches. I was worried when I went into it. I'm worried because it, with every decade that passes, I think that historical language tends to get more mealy-mouthed, more uh, litigious, and that I worry that the monsters of the past will start to get softer treatment because of that. I've seen it happen with Hitler biographies. Uh, and, but, and I was worried about that with this, but no, it, <laughs> it throws elbows all through. It pulls no punches at any point. So it, as a one-volume history of, of the Third Reich, it's really good. I do recommend it. Uh, so that'll be a reread. I'll gladly reread that this weekend. And then uh, the other one is also a reread. I read this and really liked it. It's, uh, it's by Leslie Berlin, and it's Troublemakers. Silicon Valley Comes of Age. Again, in one of these beautiful, uh, you know, matte textured finish. Uh, I don't think we, we ever saw this on this channel. Um, between 1968 and 1976, five landmark industries that shaped the modern world launched within 30 miles of each other. Uh, personal computing, video games, biotechnology, modern venture capital, and advanced semiconductor logic. Uh, here are the people who started and the stories behind the birth of the internet and the microprocessor, as well as Apple, Atari, uh, Genentech, Intel, Xerox, and iconic venture capital firms like Sequoia Capital and Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers. Uh, and I, I read this when it first came out and really liked it. Uh, but I remember thinking when I read it the first time, you know, it really helped this book if you knew a little more about some of those things that we just listed off. And at the time, I didn't know a lot about, uh, about most of them. And I think I know more now, not only thanks to this book, but other books along the same line. So I, I'd be willing to bet that my reread of this uh, will be more. I'll enjoy it more than the first time. Uh, we we shall see. Uh, and then we get to the three uh, books from my Friday reads that I haven't read yet. <laughs> they they are. Uh, keep in mind, <laughs> you already know this, but keep in mind this isn't as outlandish as it looks. I read 150 pages an hour, and I read for at least 10 hours every day. So so that if you do the numbers on that, you realize that all these books together. I could almost read in one day. So, and since I do nothing else, I do almost nothing else with my time but read. These these won't take as long as it looks like they will. Like, for instance, this first one. It's a fascinating subject, but it's a tiny book. It's less than 200 pages. And we saw it already. It's Winter War. Uh, it's the, the political and social battle between Herbert Hoover and FDR over the New Deal, over the a gigantic infusion of government of government money and control into civilian life in order to arrest and then reverse a giant economic depression. Uh, and I've read, I've read, uh, there have been two really good biographies of Herbert Hoover in the last few years. There have been two really good biographies of FDR in the last two years, and I've studied those. I've read them in close detail, reviewed them. In fact, if, as far as I know, my blurb will be on the cover of not only one of the Hoover biographies, but also one of the FDR biographies. I read them, I reviewed them, I, I know this subject matter, but I don't think I've ever read a book just on the sparring between the two over this program, so uh, so this this will be fascinating. I, I don't know how much it will teach me, but it, it often doesn't matter, right? If, if well, as, uh, Maybe maybe not right, maybe we should go over that, because in the month of nonfiction November, uh, that's key. In the month of nonfiction November, you're going to want to remember that the more you know a subject, uh, the more fascinating hunkering down over little splinter subjects like this can be. Uh, so uh, the next two, <laughs> the, the, the next two are not fiction, are not nonfiction. The next two are fiction. Uh, I, I originally went into the month thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to read no fiction other than just mass market science fiction and mass market romance or stuff that I'm paid to review. Uh, and that was enthusiasm, and it was well-intended. But it turns out I can't resist the siren call of new books. I think my reading will still be probably 80 or 90% nonfiction. But, but if I get a new release for November that is, that is fiction, considering that my November is, is a doable month, unlike October, I'm probably going to indulge. <laughs> I mean, I, it just doesn't feel right. I made, I made all those ideas about my, the, per, the percentages of my reading out of enthusiasm, yes, but in addition to being an enthusiastic reader, I am also a professional reader. And I, I just doesn't feel right to let new releases go by. 
in the month and tell myself I'll get to them in December. I, that just doesn't feel right. Not only because then they're just sitting around, these new releases asking for my attention and sitting around, but also because I don't know what form or shape December will take. It's typically a, a, a slow month, but that's relative. <laughs> so so the, these next two are fiction uh, that I'm going to be indulging. It won't take long. <laughs> the first one is by, they're both... Uh, they're both classic brands. Only one of them is live. One of them's dead. The the living brand is Barbara Taylor Bradford, and this is a uh, master of his fate. And it's a it's a Victorian historical novel, first in a series about a kid who starts from nothing, starts as a barrow boy in the in the marketplace with a dirty a dirty face and a dirty cap and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> to put it mildly, that kind of story has been written before about a boy like that who seizes every main chance and eventually becomes a merchant prince. That has been done uh, many times, including a huge book by Jeffrey Archer. Uh, and I, I'm willing to give this author the benefit of the doubt. She's, she's a terrific page-turner of a writer. I, she's got a lamentable tendency for, for a cliché. She can't resist them. And also a, a lamentable tendency for easily predictable plot twists, uh, which, you know, maybe that isn't everything in a book like this. But, but one way or another, we, we will see. I will, I will just blast right through this first in a series that's very enticing and then this next one is another the last one that we'll do today it's another phenomenon in in the terms of <clears throat> ongoing published fiction that i do not quite understand yet and want to understand and it's this necrofiction this these fictional <clears throat> properties and franchises that are kept going after their author dies in ways that I don't think have a parallel anywhere in literature, where 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 it's not that the publisher is claiming that any of these things are found manuscripts, and it's also like it's not like the publisher is claiming that the author isn't dead. It's the the, the closest I can come up with would be uh, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, where but but there in in, in Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. There's only Dixon's name on the cover. There's never any other writer of Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, even though even when he when those books were first being published, there was a whole room full of people writing them. Whereas this with necrofiction, it's not the same thing. You have Dick Francis's books, but you have someone else's name on them. You have, uh, well, you you can practically name your your kind. Some major properties have so far heroically resisted, but you have, for instance, Dune. Is a huge forest of books now, and uh, there are others that I'm that I'm uh, that I'm forgetting. Robert Parker is another example. His name is as big as life on his books. He's been dead for years, and I I am expecting uh, that this will continue to happen. Like for instance, Robert Jordan. I find it hard to believe that his literary estate will turn down the chance to do another turn of the Wheel of Time. With his name, big as life on the cover, but someone else writing the books, I'd be amazed if that wasn't in the works. And, you know, Tolkien. I mean, it's utter heresy, but... Uh, and, it, and it goes on and on and on. And one of the biggest examples is one of the biggest names when he was alive, and that's Tom Clancy. Look at how big his name is on this book. This is Oath of Office. Uh, this is a Jack Ryan novel. About his character Jack Ryan from The Hunt for Red October, only in these books he's President of the United States. And this this book is actually written by Mark Cameron. And it says so right there. It says, Oath of Office by Mark Cameron. So what's this doing? What is that? <laughs> That's not part of the title. And it's not an author. This is not this was not co-writing. I mean Clancy worked with co-writers in the last years of his life, but he never thought, saw, nor thought, nor heard anything about the plots or, or developments in these books. He's not involved in any way, and there is his name. So what is that? What is that? I, I don't have any idea, and I want to know. I want to understand necrofiction. I want to understand what readers who come to it without knowing the original writers think of it. Because, And also I want, to, I want to understand what the publishing industry thinks of it. Obviously they have different philosophies. Because some uh, publishers own their liter the literary rights to an author's work, and they haven't authorized this kind of stuff. And other publishers have authorized it, but only as continuations. Like, for instance, the Pern novels are continuing, uh, but not. But they're but they're different. They're Pern novels by different people than Anne McCaffrey. 
Whereas this, I don't know what you're supposed to think about a cover design like that, and they're all designed like this. So I, I don't really know, but uh, but I read them anyway, especially since uh, the the couple of authors that that the publisher gets to write to to further Tom Clancy's stories, whether it, whether it be Jack Ryan novels or other things, the authors that they get tend to be better than Clancy was, <laughs> smarter, better at pacing, certainly better at exposition dumping, uh, and that makes them fun to read. Just fun techno thrillers to read. I just it's just having that name, Biggs Life up there when this is just pastiche fiction. This is someone writing in Tom Clancy's characters and putting them in situations Tom Clancy didn't devise or imagine. Uh, but anyway, let me tell you about the circumstance here, because it, it seems really good. Uh, what have we got? Uh, let's see here. And this this comes out at the end of uh, the at the end of November. Uh Let's see here. In Oath of Office, protests have broken out across Iran in what the media is calling a Persian Spring. Uh, but while U.S. leaders clamor to back the Iranian rebels, President Jack Ryan remains wary. On the home front, a deadly strain of flu is ravaging the country, floods are decimating the southeast, and a crooked senator is attempting to bring down the Ryan administration and is willing to lean on bot-planted, quote, fake news in order to do it. Meanwhile, two Russian nuclear missiles have been hijacked, and Jack Ryan Jr., our hero's super haughty son, uh, has been abducted in Afghanistan while on the trail. President Ryan must call on John Clark and the rest of the campus team to race against time and track down the missiles and rescue Jack Jr. As sensational stories spin out of control and the stolen missiles remain out of reach, President Ryan's toughest challenge emerges. How do you meet an enemy head-on when he won't even show you his face? Now, see, that is... Uh, you can tell from that description that this is this is uh, leaner and more oriented explicitly towards entertainment than Clancy ever did, and his fans will say have said, and some convincingly, some eloquently, uh, that that was a strength of his, that that was a narrative strength of his, that he that he never really pandered to this to that sort of thing, never kept many plates in the air, never really cared to rip things from the headlines, that he had sort of his own extra wonky stories to tell extra wonky and incredibly xenophobic stories to tell and maybe that's true maybe it is i've i've read i i, I suspect that sometime in 21st century i will reread all of tom clancy's original novels and maybe i'll do it as part of some longer study of necrofiction and what it actually means uh certainly i know that as on a, as page turners uh these books and the ones by mark greeny are better tom clancy novels than anything that tom clancy wrote but I don't know what it means in a larger sense. Uh, but anyway, I'll be reading this uh, for Friday Read. So I'll be reading, uh, excuse me, Oath of Office uh, by Mark Cameron. I'll be reading uh, Master of His Fate by Robert Taylor Bradford. Uh, I'll be reading Winter War uh, about FDR versus Roosevelt, uh, versus Hoover. Then I'll be rereading Troublemakers about this just incredible, uh, groundbreaking stuff that happened. In Silicon Valley, roughly all at the same time. Uh, then uh, Childers' History of the Third Reich, and these these lovely trade paperbacks. Uh, and then The Hazards of Time Travel, Joyce Carol Oates, and uh, Kitchen Confidential uh, by the late Anthony Bourdain. Uh, first time I've reread it uh, since I read it originally, so it's it's bound to be a little bittersweet. <laughs> ha. And that, as usual, at, you know, at the end of these videos, I want to know what you're working on uh, this weekend. I I. Uh, I don't know what the weather will be like here. I th it's certainly, I was just out with Frida Bean, and it certainly smells like there's going to be rain here. Uh, one of my teenagers, uh, one of my super haughty teenagers, uh, is a home at his parents' house in upstate New York, uh, uh, and they're getting snow, at least a light dusting of snow. They're, they're getting this same storm system uh, that much further north is working slightly different stuff for them, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it's hard on him. Because he has 3% body fat. And he's such a tobacco addict at age 20 uh, that he's got to spend 20 minutes out of every 60 outside the house. And that's that's no picnic for, for him because the poor thing. He gets so cold. <laughs> Plus, he's got his body is working off so many calories with the sheer effort of holding up his head considering how heavy all the product is in his hair. It's not easy. It's not easy being pretty... I know that well. <laughs> so so if, it, if it's inclement weather, I'll probably just stay in and read all weekend. Fortunately... My little schnauzer loves to meet people. She loves to step 
up to jump up on them and have them pet her face and tell her how pretty she is. That's about it. She is not all that interested in going on long hikes. She is not all that interested in being out in any kinds of inclement weather. And recently, I've gotten the strong impression that she also doesn't particularly like the cold. <laughs> so, so she might not mind hanging out all weekend long and just reading and canoodling. We shall see. You'll you'll know because I'm going to inform you of every tedious minute of it. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll leave you alone for now, and I'll be back soon. <laughs> Thank you, book two.